Well, Thanksgiving Sunday, we, we always seem to get caught up short. No matter how much we try, we find that we, we, we fail so often in simply saying thanks, simply demonstrating gratitude. And as we think about it, there's hardly, there's hardly a day that goes by when someone hasn't done something for us, large or small. Even if it's just somebody making room for us as we're trying to change lanes, or someone behind us in the grocery line who's got three extra cents because we've come up short and, and we're looking for a little extra to just round it out so we don't have to break a 20 for three cents. Little things. It happens all the time. And all we have to do is be grateful. And the more grateful we are, the more we realize that life is a gift. And our fortunes and misfortunes, all of them come to us and are, are part of what happens as we are being held by the everlasting arms of our God. Our text this morning is one very familiar to, to all of us. It's from the 17th chapter of Luke. It's a story of the ten lepers. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from Luke. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten lepers stood at a distance crying aloud, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, Praise God! He fell at the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this, this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. A leprosy was a horrific disease when it was actually leprosy. They classed everything from empatigo and other skin issues to leprosy, but the real thing is awful. It ran its course over about a 30-year period of time, and in that time, skin began to putrefy on the surface. Fingers would drop off. And as you might imagine, with this kind of affliction, with putrefying flesh that one was carrying around, there was a horrific odor that associated itself with, with leprosy. And so the lepers of the first century were required because of its highly contagious, or at least what they thought was its highly contagious nature, were required if they encountered people who did not have the disease to cry out, unclean. How would you like to do that? How would you like to call yourself unclean? Impure. How would you like to exclude yourself from human affection? From community? How would you like to know this about yourself, that wherever you went, Oh, I look so bad. I smell so bad. I'm so sick. About a hundred years ago, a handful of businessmen out of Chicago were persuaded to go out to the mission field. And part of that which persuaded them was that they were also going to get on, be able to go on a safari while they were there. But they went to Africa. And they went into a leper colony. And there, working in the leper colony, was a number of nuns, and, and they went into one particular tent. And as they did, they were overwhelmed by the sight and the smell. And there was a, a tiny little nun working away on the wounds of one of the lepers. And these businessmen stood and watched, and. One said deep down, almost under his breath, 
said, I wouldn't give a million dollars to do that. Well, the nun looked up and said, I wouldn't take a million dollars to do this either. I do it because of the need that exists. I do it for the sake of these people, not for the sake of myself. And that is the, the acting out of human gratitude. The acting out of a, of a life that has been gripped, changed, transformed by the, the power of love that God shows to us. There are certain things we wouldn't take a million dollars to do. But we do it. Because we know it is the right thing to do. We know and our hearts and lives are moved by such gratitude. You realize that is the real motive of Christian morality. Not fear of hell. Not that we've got to balance the scales. We've got to have enough good stuff to counterbalance the bad stuff in our life. None of that. The motive force of the Christian life and Christian morality and ethics is gratitude. We are so grateful for what has been given to us. So glad for the gift that God has given to us. You know, this week I was at breakfast with my atheist friends and I've been at it for, I think, it might be coming up onto four years now. And as I say, they're lousy atheists. They are, they're too nice, they're too kind. They have a sense of meaning and purpose and and I take all that and parlay that into my salvos that I shoot up against their, their defenses and try to break up their faith. But there was a great sermon that was preached to them this past Tuesday morning that I never could have anticipated. Toward the end of breakfast, one of them stopped mid-sentence and shared with us at the table that he had a brain tumor. He didn't ask for prayer. He just shared it with us. Don't know what all it is, but he wanted us to know. He was reaching out for what he doesn't know. But he reached out. And then as we were wrapping up, waitress came and said that the man sitting at the table right behind us had picked up the tab for the whole table. That man, many of you know, member of our church, Pat O'Connor. Pat has a manner, a nature of generosity, of giving, but also responding. I know he heard. And his act of appreciation his act of generosity did more to transform those two than all those breakfasts. All of that time, all of my efforts, a simple act that demonstrated that he cared. That simple act. So Jesus is on his way into Jerusalem. And as he goes, he's preaching to all kinds of people. There are all kinds of people coming around him. And then through the crowd of people, as if right down this middle aisle, if this is the street, comes a, a gathering of lepers, torn up clothes, hands that are like stumps, faces covered with sores. And what precedes them is the vile aroma that they exude. And they're crying out, unclean, unclean, but, but everyone already knows. They, they know what this looks like. They know what it smells like. They've already parted to stay away. Jesus sees them. And he hears them. And he has compassion on them. They are operating according to the religious law, according to all the requirements put on them. They're acting in full compliance to the law. Jesus sees them, 
And he says, in compliance to the law, go show yourself to the priests. So they turn, and as they turn and start to move, they realize that their flesh is being cleansed. That somehow, some way, they are being fully restored. And they're made whole. Then one of them, one of them breaks the rules. One of them is a renegade. One of them doesn't go to the priest. One of them doesn't comply with the requirements of the religious structures of the day. He turns around and come back, comes back. He's overwhelmed with joy. He's so glad. And he cries out. And he falls at Jesus' feet, thanking him. This, this renegade who comes back and is so grateful, this, this foreigner, this one, this outsider, this Samaritan, he was one that the Jews loved to hate. He comes back and he praises God. We see Jesus here contrasting the needs of people with the laws of religious authority. The laws of religious authority that define people out, that exclude people. And the reality is that what matters is not whether or not we're playing by the rules, but whether or not we are, we're living life, gratitude to God. I was so pleased this week to find out that that corner over there, that's where we do our, our stuff for missions. But that is filling up. And um, as we go into the Christmas season, we're going to be collecting toys again for Missy Ohm Peniel and, and all that. You know, it's the rice and beans and clothes and toiletries, all that sort of thing. Those people that we serve are qualified not by their legal status. I don't know if any of those hundreds of people, I don't know if any of them are legal, quote, legal. But they're hungry, they're naked, they're poor, they're needy. What qualifies them for the love of God's people but their need? Not that they have complied with some structure of legality, but that they are needy. And so we go and respond to human need. Just as a church visits people in prison, people who've done horrible things, we respond to human need. We simply go because we too are a grateful people. We too are a people who know the joys of transformation. So Jesus, with this one, lifts his eyes with the Samaritan cleansed of his leprosy at his feet, lifts his eyes at the gathered crowd, and says, where are the other nine? I thought about that this week as I realized I was one of those other nine in response to Pat O'Connor. I had forgotten to thank him. I was busy. No excuse. Not even a decent explanation. I forgot. The other nine. Forget? They're too busy? They're too excited about getting home? Going back to family and friends? Too many things going on just to stop and say thanks? Where are the other nine? Jesus asks. <laughs> Here we are. We're here. It's all of us. We all forget. We're all too busy. We're all preoccupied. We all have things to do. We all have our goals and, and things that we want to accomplish. We have family and friends, etc., that, that we want to, and we can forget to say thanks, simply because we are people on the way. And so the, the question, where are the nine? That's our point of identification. And yet we're oftentimes also like that Samaritan. 
Things happen also in our lives where we are so overwhelmed and so grateful, so thankful. We have been given good news. We have been given a transforming word and we are so grateful and we thank God or we thank others who've helped us along because it means so much. But ultimately this is about having our own perspectives on life and, and our place in it and our place in relationship with God and relationship with others, others our perspective shifting, the old paradigm shift discussion, that we go through a shift, a change in our way of thinking. When I went to seminary, the dean of the chapel, Dean Ernest Gordon, was the dean at Princeton University Chapel. And I went to hear him a couple of times, wonderful man, and um, he had a transforming experience in his life. An experience that he called the miracle on the River Kwai. We've seen, we, we, we've seen the movie. But he wrote a book about something that happened amidst his own group of, of men during the Second World War as prisoners of war with the Jap Japanese working on the River Kwai, on, on the railroads. And, and those GIs who were there, if they stumbled or fell, the Japanese would kill them. If they complained, they would kill them. One thing after another, there was no mercy demonstrated at all by the, the Japanese keepers of these men. They were emaciated, hungry, thirsty and life was so miserable and they they found themselves watching out for number one just hoarding food to themselves anytime they could anytime they found anything at all they would they would keep it to themselves and then one day one of the prison guards lined them all up and screamed at them he said there's a shovel missing there's a shovel missing and you must produce it. Whoever took this shovel must speak up now or all die, all die. Speak up or all die. And he began to go close and he raised his rifle to strike Ernest Gordon. And then down the line, another one of the GIs stepped forward and said, I did it. I did it. I took the shovel. The prison guard went over to him immediately and brought his rifle down into his skull, killing him immediately. And among the believers who were there emerged the verse in their own hearts and minds and their memory, greater love is known than this, that they give up their life for their friends. And he who supposedly had taken the shovel, stepped forward and took the, pu the punishment. At the end of the day, when all the work was done, and all the equipment restored, they realized there was no missing shovel. He had stepped forward to take the punishment on himself rather than see his comrades die. And Dean Gordon writes that that act of self-sacrifice, that act of giving, changed all of them so that now they came together and they didn't hoard things anymore. They shared everything that they had. They prayed for one another. They demonstrated care for one another. There was a joy that emerged in the midst of these prisoners that empowered so many of them to survive and to make it through. When that one soldier demonstrated among the many, the one amongst the nine, 
demonstrated a love, a gratitude, and a faith that even our lives cannot be taken from us. When we trust in our God, we can step forward and, and give of who we are, what we are, all that we are, and that in Christ we are more than conquerors through him who first loved us. That we cannot, we cannot be beaten. And so this transforming power of love makes us a grateful people. Makes us thankful. There's one final story. One that you know. Probably shared it a half dozen times. It's a wonderful story and I choke up every time I hear this hymn. Martin Rinkert was a pastor during the 30, World's, 30 Years War. And this, in this particular instance, his, his little village was being surrounded and was under siege by the Swedish. And during the siege, there was tremendous starvation. There was loss of human life. He was burying five, six, seven or eight of his parishioners every single day, including children and young people. And in the midst of that horrific loss, as he as a pastor attempted in what way he could to give some understanding to that which defies human comprehension, he wrote the hymn. He wrote the hymn. Will you bow with me in prayer? Granted, Lord, that our lives might be so transformed by the gift of your Son that we might be a giving people, grateful, thankful for all that you have done. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.